So what it's looking like, what it's looking like, we'll see how it goes. So we, you, everybody knows we have a midterm coming up. It looks like it's going to be three, through chapter 15 for the midterm. There's a, this is going to be a really hard midterm. And so, you, uh, you know, a lot of synthesis. So, so last year we had spec plus this stuff. And, and so last year we had spec plus this stuff. And so I couldn't ask as much synthesis because spec takes time, right? There's no spec on this test. So that means there's going to be more synthesis, all right? So what you want to do is you want to do as much synthesis as you can. So do the sapling synthesis. Jump straight at the end of each chapter. There's a synthesis section where it mixes reactions from all the chapters. You want to do that. Those are the things you want practice and synthesis. Okay, questions, anybody, before we get started? All right, so uh, chapter 15, really different. So we had a little bit of terminology we were talking about. Structure of radicals. Some terminology, bromide ion, bromine atom, bromine uh, molecule. Let's talk about some general features of radical reactions because we're going to have some mechanisms in this chapter. Two, two possible mechanisms from this chapter and three possible reactions from this chapter. So there's three reactions we're going to take away and use in synthesis. There's two, me two possible mechanisms from this chapter. All right. So. Um, Radicals undergo two common reactions. They react with sigma bonds and they add to pi bonds. Here's what the arrow pushing looks like. You actually have seen this before. It was in one of the chapters in 51A. When we were introducing reactivity, we talked about homolytic bond cleavage, heterolytic bond cleavage. And I, I, I didn't really emphasize it because I think this is a whole world unto itself, radical chemistry. The reaction, the, the arrows are really different, so I didn't really have students um, have to learn that. Okay, so we're, we're, the arrow pushing is completely different. So now remember, when we're doing this reaction, we're breaking the carbon-hydrogen bond homolytically. That means one electron goes to this carbon. The other electron is going to combine with the unpaired electron on X. And it looks like they're kind of combining midair, okay? That's the way we draw the arrows for that. And then once you do that, you get a CH3 radical plus HX. So whenever we're breaking a bond in radical chemistry, we're going to break it homolytically. Uh, one electron goes to carbon, one electron goes to hydrogen. The electron that belongs to hydrogen, hydrogen keeps that electron and it combines with this unpaired electron to make a new HX bond. So once we have those two electrons, we have a new bond and that's the bond right here. So that's one type of arrow pushing. And then the second type is where a radical attacks a carbon-carbon um, double bond. And we're going to see both types. All right, so again, we're going to break the pi bond, the carbon carbon pi bond, homolytically. So one electron is going to go to this carbon. The other electron from this carbon on the right is going to combine, and it looks like it's combining midair to make um, an, a, an, a new sigma bond. So, so that's the arrow pushing. And um, all of the mechanisms that we do in this chapter are going to be some combination of that arrow pushing. So the radical goes right here. So notice when we're doing these radical processes here, processes here uh, we start with a radical, we end with a radical. We start with a radical, we end with a radical, okay? All right, so radical mechanisms have three parts. So um, very likely that I will put a radical mechanism. I'll give you more details on Monday. 
um, and you have to put things into the right spot. So there is an initiation that can be one step or it can be multiple steps. There is, so there's initiation, there's propagation, and there's termination. And so if I give you a radical mechanism on this upcoming midterm, I will have this already written for you, initiation, I will have it propagation, and I will have it termination. And, um, and there's reactions and there's problems in Sapling Chapter 15 where they have you categorize reactions as initiation, propagation, and termination. And I'll show you what to look for for that. But you, if you have the right reaction and you put it in the wrong spot, you don't get points for it. So you have to be able to recognize uh, what type you have, what type of step you have. So initiation reactive intermediate is generated. So in an initiation, we start with something that's not a radical and we, we break the bond homolytically and we make two radicals. That's the initiation. And sometimes that takes a couple steps to do that. Propagation, the inter reactive intermediate reacts with the stable molecule to form another reactive intermediate and the chain continues until the supply of reactants is exhausted or the reactive intermediate is destroyed. So these radical chain, so it's like every time it, the reaction, we get one molecule reacting, then it starts the chain again. And so every time it does, a, uh, does the process, it does it, it, it's another link in the chain. And termination steps are side reactions that destroy reactive intermediates and, end up, and tend to slow or stop the reaction. So we'll see examples of each of these. I first want to talk about halogenation and then we'll look at that mechanism. Um, chlorine or bromine will react with alkanes in the presence of light or heat or added peroxide to give alkyl halides. So this is the first reaction. Um, that we want to talk about. And this is an important reaction because it allows us to take an alkane that is completely unreactive and once we put a chlorine on that alkane, now we have a functional group and now we can do, we can, we can turn that into other functional groups in all ways that we've learned. So we have an alkyl halide, we can do reactions from chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, and chapter 12, right? If we just have Ethane, for example, there's nothing we can do with it. It doesn't have a functional group. So this allows us to put a functional group on an unreactive molecule. So here's an example here. Um, this is methane plus chlorine. And you get a, you get a big mixture here. Um, this is high temperature. Starts this reaction. High temp. Light. Usually a light of a specific frequency or an initiator. And so um, the initiators that we're going to be using in this class are usually peroxides. So this peroxide is a, a free radical initiator or just a radical initiator. All right, so you need the chlorine, you need high temperature, heat, or light. Now what I normally do on my exams is I will, I will show H nu and that's a trigger to you to make you think, okay, this means it's a reaction from chapter 15. It's a radical reaction and that helps you out. Because I'm sure as of, as of right now, all these reactions are swimming in your head right now and it's kind of hard to keep them straight in some ways. The second example uses bromine and this is light and temperature to get this reaction to go. So this is not necessarily easy, easy to do. And this reaction is much more selective. We'll talk about why coming up. You actually um, only get one product here. So chlorination not as selective. We'll see that coming up. Um, bromination much more selective. All right, so this is a radical chain reaction. And I'm going to do the mechanism for example one and then we're going to do an abbreviated mechanism for example two. We'll do both of them. And um, I'm not going to show, I'm not going to show formation of all, all of these products. I'm just going to show you a few here. Okay, sorry about that. I went the wrong way. Okay, initiation um, is, uh, is where the radical is formed to start the process going. In order for a, a free radical chain reaction to happen, you only need one radical to start. Okay, and if that radical sticks around a long time, 
um, I mean, if it's there and it's going to create new radicals, that reaction will keep, go keep on going. So it's not, when you do a radical reaction, you're not hitting it with light and all the radicals are forming at the same time. It's, it's, it's one molecule at a time and every time you complete the reaction, you get another link in the chain. So um, for a radical formed, and, and this is going to always be where we break a weak bond. All right, so here's some examples in the top corner of weak bonds. So the, notice bond association energies are all really universally low here. Um, fluorine, fluorine bond 38, chlorine, chlorine 59, bromine, bromine 46, iodine, iodine bond 36, peroxide 51, this is terp butyl peroxide, diterp butyl peroxide 38. And um, what is something these all have in common? Besides the fact that they have um, small bond association energies, what do they all have in common? Well, w I, think I, I think I heard it. Um, both of these atoms have lone pairs and they're right next to each other. Okay, so, so, the, so the, um, the, the, this has lone pairs, that has lone pairs, and they're right next to each other. And so what happens with those lone pairs is they want to, they, want, they repel each other. And so they want to move further away because there's, ele there's electron electron repulsion. And when they move further away, that lengthens the bond and makes it weaker, right? So this goes all the way back to 51A. Strong bonds are short bonds, um, weak bonds are longer bonds. So the electron electron repulsion from those lone pairs is going to want to make those things pull away from each other and it's going to weaken the bond. So that's what's going on. So let's throw some lone pairs on here so you can be reminded of that. Having too much fun drawing lone pairs here. So good, good, good thing, good, good point to make about um, weak bonds here. I like this because I can actually write these a little faster than I can with a with a pen for the transparencies. How about that? Okay, you see a whole lot of lone pairs going on. So that makes, a good, um, that makes a good point. So what we have is two hetero atoms. And the other thing that's really good is that um, when I have my hand, I'm, I, my hand is completely covering this and it's not covering it at all up there. So that's one, another thing I like about this um, tablet here. So two hetero atoms bonded together. both with lone pairs. So that makes it for a weaker, a weaker bond and a weaker bond is easier to break. Okay, so when we have chlorine, so chlorine, chlorine, that's on our, our, our weak bonds. So the radical is formed and so we're going to make a chlorine, chlorine bond and we're going to break it um, homolytically. So we have chlorine, so we start off in an initiation, we start off with a neutral molecule that's not a radical and we end up with two radicals. And that's what starts the process rolling. So how do we know if something's an initiation step? We start off with something that's not a radical and we create new radicals. That's how you know if it's initiation. Propagation. So what's going to happen here is we have methane. So I'll draw methane, but I'm going to draw out one of the bonds for methane. And the chlorine radical that we formed in the initiation. And we're going to do the same arrow pushing we did on the previous page. Um, the chloride, chlorine radical is going to abstract that hydrogen. But remember, when we do radical reactions, we're going to break each bond um, homolytically. So we break that carbon-hydrogen bond. Carbon gets one electron, hydrogen gets the one electron. The electron that hydrogen gets combines with the unpaired electron in chlorine to make a new hydrogen-chlorine bond.
So we get hydrochloric acid as our side product. And then the methyl radical that we just formed It's going to grab a chlorine. So we're going to break this chlorine-chlorine bond homolytically, but the electron from the chlorine on the left is going to combine with the unpaired electron on, on the methyl radical, and we're going to get our product. And that's the other thing that we're going to see in a propagation step. So that's one chain. That's one link in the chain. And um, as you can see, that what we've done here is we've regenerated the radical that we started with. So this is going to come in and it's going, there's, our, there's a link in the chain, and it's going to come in and it's going to do it again. It's going to keep cycling through. So we regenerate the radical we started with. Yep. You can, and I'm going to show that. In a, that's a termination step. Okay, I'm going to show that in just a second. So we regenerate the radical that you started with. And the other thing I want you to notice is that um, we've always keeping the same number of radicals in propagation steps. So in this one, we start with a radical, we end with a radical. Here we start with a radical and a neutral molecule, we end with a radical. I mean, or, or a non, you know, a molecule without, with, with all electrons paired. So start with a radical, end with a radical. Start with a radical, end with a radical. So when you're sorting those problems and sapling into boxes, that's what you're looking for. The number of radicals stays the same. One here, one here, one here, one here. In the first one, we started with none and made two. That's what makes that an initiation step. So note, um, the number of radicals stays the same. in propagation steps. So definitely want to make sure that you look for that. Now termination is, is really the opposite of initiation. In initiation you start with something that's not a radical and you break it into two radicals. In termination you, you combine two radicals and you make it into something that's non, a non-radical. That's a termination step. So that's what you're going to look for when you're doing this, your sorting. So pretty much any radical that we have here can combine with any other radical. So for example, we could have um, we could have a chlorine radical, and this is to answer your question, combining with a methyl radical. So it looks like that. We could have a, that would give you the product that we're going to get anyway. It's just made by a different pathway. That would give you methyl chloride. We could have two methyl radicals combining. That will give you ethane. So that will give you ethane. Um, you can also have two chlorine radicals recombine.
All right, so these end up being some side products that you get. Well, the first one's not a side product. Um, this, the third one's not a side product, but certainly ethane is not something that we're trying to make. Okay, and so um, usually we don't get very much of these termination steps because let's imagine that we start off with one molecule of chlorine breaking. Okay, so let's imagine we have just one molecule do this. So we only have two chlorines here, right? Two chlorine radicals. What are the chances of those two chlorine radicals? Um, they're going to they're be stirring in that reaction. They're going to be moving around doing this reaction over and over again in the, term, in the, in the propagation. The chance of those two actually uh, inter interacting and colliding and recombining is very small. So there will be a lot more propagation then there will be termination. But you still do get these side products, okay? And so um, that's why it's not a very complete, um, it's, not, it's, very, it's not a very clean reaction because um, we don't want to, you know, no one's going to want to have to separate all of these possible products here. So you see we have a lot here. We have methyl chloride. Now um, you can imagine to, to, form, to form methylene, um, to form this one right here, we would just, a radical would come and remove another proton from methyl chloride. That's how we would get some of this. Um, to get this, this is chloroform, we would have a, a radical come and remove another hydrogen from carbon here. And then we'd, that, that's how we would form this. You could do that four times. You could replace all four hydrogens with chlorine. And here, this product right here would be from the ethyl, ethyl that we formed in, in our termination step. So you get a lot of, uh, it's kind of a messy reaction here. So uh, the competing propagation step here Let me, I'll show, I'll show formation of the dichloromethane here. So you can see what I'm talking about here. If this comes in and grabs a proton, instead of from methane, it, it grabs a proton from methyl chloride. Then you form this radical. And now what's that radical going to do? That radical is going to um, come and grab a, it's going to come in right here. Where are we? It's going to come in here. It's going to grab a chlorine and that's how you get dichloromethane. Let's show that. So kind of a messy reaction here. Notice my single-headed arrows here. Okay, everybody see how that's formed? So what did we say? We said about 80%, we get in about 80% methyl chloride in this reaction and we get 20% of these other little side products that have to be separated. One of the ways to get this reaction to go a little bit better and a little bit cleaner is to uh, keep, the, keep the concentration of these side products low. Keep concentration low by using a large excess of methane. All right, so since methane's a gas, you would use a large excess of methane and then that will increase the amount of methyl chloride you get and some of these other little side products will be um, much less. Question about that mechanism, anybody? All right, so as we say on the next page, this isn't a very good reaction because it's not very clean. It's not the best way to synthesize alkyl halides. There are better ways, but it's still useful because it is the only way to convert an inert alkane into a, a reactive compound. It's the only way that we know to take an inert alkane like propane, ethane, methane, 
and add a functional group on it. Once we put a chlorine or a bromine on there, now we can take that and do all the other reactions we know that we can do with alkyl halides. Um, but until we do that, we, we're stuck. So this is, even though it's, it's not a very good reaction, it's the only way, it's the only thing we have. So another better way to synthesize alkyl chlorides, we learned in chapter 10, right? If we do it this way, we don't get a million little side products. So that's what we would do if we wanted to make an alkyl halide. Um, for alkyl bromides, we would use um, HBr. So there are better ways. What's the difference here, though? Are we starting with a compound that, has, that doesn't have a functional group? No, we're, uh, we are, we're starting with a compound that's an alkene that has a functional group. It has a functional group that can be converted into other functional groups. So this is different. It's a better way to make alkyl halides, but there, our starting material has a functional group right here. There's a functional group. That alkene's a functional group. And so we're just converting it to another functional group. If we have an alkene, we have no functional group. This has no functional groups. So we can't take base and remove that proton because it has a pKa of 50. So this is the only way that we have to put a, put a functional group on there. And then once we do that, we can convert it into other things. Questions so far? Anybody? Let's look at the second mechanism. This one's a lot cleaner. So uh, we take tertiary butane, bromine, light, and heat. And let's draw our product. Single product here. We don't get a lot of different products here. All right, so initiation, a radical formed, we always break a weak bond. We got a weak bond here. Did I not leave you time? Sorry about that. Okay, so we're going to break a weak bond. That's easy, break a weak bond homolytically. We start off with um, a non-radical, we end up with two radicals. Now, again, I want to make the point that not all of the bromine, not all of the molecular bromine bonds are going to break. Just a few of them. Not all of them are going to break. We only really require one to break, and that's enough to get all of our starting material converted into products. So propagation, and I drew some of these already to make it a little easier. I should probably draw that bond a little longer. So we go here. Okay, so tert butyl radical plus HBr. And then the tert butyl radical comes in, it's really the same mechanism here, grabs a bromine. So, uh, so we still have brom we have still have molecular bromine. We still have got the bro this bromine in here that hasn't been broken apart. And this is gonna come, and, gonna come and grab a bromine from that. And when it does that, it forms our product and we always want to look for this. It's, gonna, it's going to regenerate the radical that we started with at propagation. So always the last step here is going to be regenerating the radical that we started with. And definitely you want to look for that. So this one here, that's what we started with. And now it's going to cycle back through again. So most of the bromine is going to be broken apart this way, not this way. Questions? I hear a lot of um, s 
Oh, I, what did I do? Oh, I, I forgot. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I knew I did. It, it means one of two things. I've either scrolled too quickly or I made a mistake. How about that? That's looking too much like a dog there. Let's try to fix that. How about that? Is that better? Okay. Regenerate the radical that we started with. All right. Termination. Radicals destroyed by, re, um, destroyed by recombining. Recombine any two radicals here. You fill in. There's three possible. And by the way, on the test, I will have an initiation section, I will have a propagation, I will have a termination. And what I always do on the test is I say, show me one termination. That's all I want to see. You don't have to draw all three, I just want to see one. So whatever one you think you like the best, that's what you can include. All right, so possible mechanism. Radical halogenation. I will have some sort of alkane. I will have either bromine or chlorine and light and heat and all of that. That's one possible mechanism for a midterm two. All right, I want to say something about selectivity. Very selective with bromine, right? It turns out that bromine is a much more selective reagent than chlorine and we're going to explain why that is. Okay, so let's look at this. We've got one tertiary hydrogen, let's remind ourselves what the tertiary, tertiary hydrogen is, a, ter a tertiary hydrogen is a bonded to a tertiary carbon. That carbon is bonded to three other carbons so it's a tertiary carbon. And we have how many primary hydrogens? Nine equivalent tertiary hydrogens. Our primary hydrogens, nine primary hydrogens. So we've got nine to one ratio of, t of primary to tertiary hydrogens and we still get no primary hydrogens abstracted. We get no product that comes from a primary hydrogen being extracted. So statistically, you are nine times as likely but you don't get any. You don't, what do you not get any? You don't get any primary hydrogen abstracted, so you don't get any of this product here. This product would result from a primary hydrogen being extract, extracted. Any one of those nine would give you this product. And you don't get any of that, so let's put a big X through that. None of that product is formed. So we need to do, we, we need to explain why that is. There's two factors that we need to talk about to explain this. Number one is the relative stabilities of the radicals formed. And um, so we have tertiary radical, more stable than secondary radical, more stable than primary, more stable than methyl radical. Okay, so if we remove one of those primary hydrogens, we're forming a primary radical. And so maybe not surprising it, that we don't get any of that formed at all because we know that primary radicals are very unstable. Similar to carbocation primaries, very unstable. The other thing that's not obvious is that we have to look at the ease at which the different hydrogens are removed. And in order to do this, you can look at the bond association energies and energy of activation. So we'd actually have to do some calculations. We're not going to do any calculations. So. Um, but I want to show you the, what the relative rates of hydrogen abstraction by halogen atoms for bromine primary is 1 to 82 to 1,640. So tertiary, forming a tertiary radical is 1,640 times more likely than forming a primary with a bromine radical. And since we only have a 9 to 1 ratio, there's not a chance statistically that we're going to be removing one of those primary hydrogens. 
The selectivity for tertiary is way too great. Uh, chlorine, on the other hand, we're going to just relative rates, we'll have one for primary, 2.5 and 4. Okay, so if we did this exact same reaction with chlorine, we will get some of the primary product, right? And that's because there's only a 4 to 1 um, selectivity. For tertiary over primary is 4 to 1. And we have nine times the number of primary carbons. So we will get primary here. So much more, much less selective. And you're beginning to see why I, I tend to favor bromine because you know, it's a better leaving group. It works better in this reaction. And it's better in a lot of different reactions. So I tend to favor it. All right, so why is the bromine uh, atom so much more selective? It seems like it just should have to do with carbocation stability, but it's not. Remember, we're doing other things in this reaction. So um, if you com it turns out if you compare transition states and activation energies for the abstraction of a hydrogen atom by a bromine radical versus a chlorine radical, you will find that. Number one, abstraction of a hydrogen atom by bromine is endothermic, while abstraction of a hydrogen atom by chlorine is exothermic. This sounds crazy difficult. It's really not that bad. Um, and number two, the transition states for the endothermic bromination have a larger di energy difference than those for the exothermic chlorination, even though, and that shouldn't be on that page, but even though the energy difference in the products is the same in both reactants. Okay, it's like, whoa, wrap your head around that, right? So let's see if I can explain this graphically here for you. So. What we said on the previous page is abstraction of a hydrogen atom by bromine is endothermic while abstraction of a hydrogen atom by chlorine is exothermic. So here is um, alkane and chlorine exothermic. So the, this radical here is down here. And then if we do bromine, it's endothermic. So this radical is higher in energy. Okay, so let's label that. This is um, exothermic reaction. And this is uh, endothermic reaction. The rate of the reaction is going to have to do with the height of that energy barrier. What do we know about the structure of the transition state in an exothermic reaction? Does it look more like the reactant for that reaction or the product? It's closer in energy to this. And we're starting off with one thing. We're starting off with one thing. We have a very exothermic reaction. Um, the difference in, the, in energy between these transition states is so close because it looks more like the alkane than it does the radical. Very, very close in energy. So what that means is that when you do the chlorination, you're going to be equally likely to take all three of these pathways. Yes, the red, the red pathway down here is lower in energy, but these are all very close by. So they're all accessible. Over here, we have an endothermic reaction. By Hammond's postulate, we know that in an endothermic reaction, the um, transition state looks more like the products of that reaction. And so since there's a big energy difference here between these three products, there's also going to be a big energy difference here between the transition states. And so you can start to see now that with brom bromination, this lower energy pathway um, is so low and these are much too high for it to overcome that energy barrier. Okay, so all the molecules are going to take that pathway because there's a big energy difference here. Here there's not. It's a small energy difference. So we want to definitely want to label that a little better here. Let's label that. So exothermic reaction, therefore the transition state resembles, and we're only looking at one step here. Transition state resembles uh, reactants more than products. In an endothermic reaction, the, the transition state resembles products more than reactants.
And so if you look here, um, this is a really small energy difference between these guys. These are two tiny little arrows. I don't know if you're going to be able to see those, but very small energy difference. It is less than 1 kcal per mole. So three very accessible transition states, and so you're going to get a, you're going to get a, a, a big a mixture here. And then here, these guys here, this is a, a large energy difference. And what do we have here? This is about, I've maybe exaggerated a little bit more. Um, this is 2 kcals per mole. And that's enough that you, uh, so if you, if you add 2 kcals per mole, if you've got tertiary, if you, if you got tertiary versus primary, that's 2 kcals per mole plus 2, we're talking about 4 kcals per mole. That's a really large energy difference for transition states. So, um, so we, we have the large energy difference here. This one has a much bigger energy difference. Therefore, the rates of the reactions will be markedly different. And this is a really good example of the point that when you're talking about rates of reaction, it does not have to do with the intermediates. These intermediates and these intermediates have the same energy difference. Um, and, and if it was only because of that, then we would have the same product outcome whether we use bromine and chlorine. It has to do with the height of the transition state here. That's, what, that's what's key. All right, so here's an example here to show you what this means difference-wise in selectivity. So here we have bromination, here we have chlorination. With bromination we get one product 82 percent. With um, chlorination we get 26 percent this product, 22 percent this product, 22 percent this product, 14 percent this product, and 17 percent. And you can actually predict these percentages by taking into account the difference in selectivity of chlorine versus the number of hydrogens that you have, and you can actually calculate these differences. The textbook we had before this had you do that. Um, this textbook doesn't have it, so I'm not, I'm not going to have you learn that. You'll be glad about that. You're very glad. It's not that hard, but you'll, you're glad. All right, questions? on bromination of alkanes or chlorination of alkanes. That's reaction number one from this chapter. Radical substitution of benzylic and allyl, that's, that's reaction number two in this chapter. Um, we are going to skip the mechanism here. But you need to know the reaction for synthesis. Why am I having you skip the mechanism? It's a confusing mechanism. It has both single-headed arrows and double-headed arrows. And it's just so hard to wrap your head around when you're just learning organic chemistry for the first time. How do I know that? Because I remember having to memorize this mechanism. And, and a lot of mechanisms that I didn't really need to memorize, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm having you, I'm selectively having you memorize certain things, as little as possible though. So we're skipping the mechanism and you don't, you don't, need, to, you don't need, need to know that. Recall that allyl and benzyl radicals are both more stable than tertiary radicals. We know the more stable the radical, the faster it can be formed. So a hydrogen bonded to either benzylic or allylic carbon can be preferentially be substituted in a halogenation reaction. So 
Again, these guys are more stable than tertiary, so that means that if you have a choice between removing a tertiary hydrogen or benzylic or allylic, benzylic or allylic will win. So um, here's some examples here. Br2. We can make this radical right here. We won't form a primary radical. We'll only form that one. And, and then if we carry that on, we will get benzyl bromide, a substituted benzyl bromide. So the bromine will go in the benzyl position. Nowhere else can you put that bromine. If we have allyl, um, then we can put, uh, we have a choice between vinyl, hydrogen, or allyl. Okay, so here's vinyl right here. Are we going to form any of that? Not when we've got allyl that we can form, right? So that's way better. So that means that um, we can form the allyl radical. And we can convert that into allyl bromide. So who sees a competing reaction that can form with this, these two? Who sees another reaction that's competing with that? From chapter 10. Yeah, and, and you know, bromination of an alkene is an extremely fast reaction. You guys did this in the lab, didn't you? How fast was it? It was really fast. So how are we going to do this when we can do this just as fast? Okay, so um, I'm going to give you a different reagent for this. We're not going to use this reagent. We're going to give you a special reagent for this that I want you to use instead. And that's because we have competing reactions here. We can, with bromine, we can form a bromonium ion. Let's remember this. We don't want to forget this. This is midterm two material, right? Not to bring up an unpleasant subject, but you know, right? Nobody likes taking tests. In graduate school, um, in chemistry, you take one year of classes and then you work in a lab for the rest of the time while you earn your PhD. And I remember thinking at the time, I've only got one more year of classes in me. I cannot do this for two years. I just was so burned out on taking tests. So I, I haven't had to take a test since then, and it's a beautiful thing. Because nobody likes taking tests. All right, so remember this, okay? So that's a competing reaction. That's a competing very fast reaction. And so really, let's not use bromine for this. Even though um, Smith uses this a lot in synthesis, I want you to not use this reagent. And, I'll, and, so that, and that's the reason why. We'll stop right there, and I will, we will finish chapter 15 next time. So this is the reagent I want you to use instead.